boys are cool. All right, so we need to find A. We have not used our initial conditions. They're in the upper right corner in blue right there. So we'll go with our TB of 0 equals 98 degrees. So we're going to plug in initial conditions. To find con I think there's just one constant. Nope, oh, there's two constants, A and K. So we got TB of 0 equals 98 degrees. Let's not worry about units. Equals 98 equals, so we got a e to the 0 plus 68, so subtract 68 gives us 30, and that's a, is that right? Sorry. Seems right. I just don't trust my arithmetic skills. Alright, so we now have a little bit more accurate tb of t. Is 30 you negative KT plus 68 so I could plug in our second initial condition but the problem is we don't know little K we basically don't know the rate of cooling uh, <clears throat> this K is going to depend on generally basically the size of the actual uh, body and then maybe if it was wearing some winter jacket it's going to cool a lot slower things like that if it was in shorts and a t-shirt it's going to cool a lot faster things like this so that's basically what that K is it's kind of the rate of change so I think we don't have enough information in here the way the problem was written to determine this let's go ahead and just try it out and then we'll see exactly what I'm talking about so we're going to try the second condition now So our condition is TB of little t equals 72 degrees. So we got 30 e to the negative k t, because we still don't know t, plus 68 equals 72. So 72 minus 68 is 4. And divide by 30. fifteenths. So the problem is <coughs> I can take natural log, that's easy. Negative K T equals ln of two fifteenths. So bring the negative to the other side. What type of algebra rule did I just use? Uh, natural log rule. What natural log rule? So it was a negative one coefficient, turns into a negative one power, which reciprocates our fraction. So I skipped a step by bringing the negative to the other side. All right, but the problem is, if I don't know k, can't find t, so I need some more information to get the k variable out of here, or the k constant out of here. So this problem is as good as we're going to get is right here. I could solve for t. It's kind of at this point, that's super easy to do. So if I knew k, I could figure out the time. So we would basically need another observation. So for example, in this actual word problem, if we look back at the word problem, the way it was written, uh, <clears throat> what you would need to do is basically wait until the body cooled another two degrees. You need to get another data point. So we basically need a third data point. And if we waited, until the body hit, let's say, 70 degrees, we would have a time between the time we checked initially and the time that we checked, that we found it was 70 degrees. So there'd be an elapsed time that we'd also know. So the way it's written, this is the best we can do right here. So we'll leave it there instead of trying to write another condition into the problem.
So any algebra or calculus questions on this? So we're about to jump into 18. So we just stopped on 15. Yeah, so I don't really do anything from 16 or 17. Oh, okay. um, I don't know exactly what they. See, my notes may have that. It's like vertical motion for 16. Yeah, so there's some motion. And, but I either thought that was too similar to what we did in calculus already or what you've done in physics, so I decided to kind of skip that, oh. that stuff. I mean, physical motion and movement and all that is important, but you probably did so much of that in physics and even calculus class that I'm not going to go uh, through all that. 17 label as pursuit curves and relative pursuit curves. So basically it's all physical motion type stuff, uh, which we did a whole bunch in Calc 3 as well. Um, and if we only stick to two dimensions, it gets a little bit, it's a little restrictive, basically, uh, because we're stuck in two dimensions here. So we're going to review complex numbers before we actually go and uh, use them. So I only have two pages on my notes of review, so we'll get through this pretty quick. Uh, and then we'll get into linear independence of functions. So what's the one thing you should remember about i? It's the square root of negative 1. That's one way to remember it. The other way, the other property of i, it's the exact same property. What is i squared? Negative one. negative 1. So you could basically, you probably already know both of them, but you only really need to know one of them, and you get the other one for free, basically. And let's go ahead and just keep going with the pattern i cubed. What was the title of the chapter? Complex number properties, or complex numbers. So we got i squared times i, which is negative 1i known as negative i and then we'll do i to the fourth is i squared squared so that's negative one squared which is positive one and we can keep going with this cycle but I think you've seen this before i to the fifth i to the sixth i to the seventh i to the eighth just repeats these four values so let's just do i to the 37th how would we break down i to the 37th power What's the best power of i, the easiest power of i of the four I wrote down? Four. Four. So how many fours are hiding in 37? Nine. So we'll try nine. So it's i to the nine times four. And what is, nine times four is 20? 36. So we need plus one. So it's i to the fourth to the ninth times i to the first power. So four plus nine, or four times nine is uh, 36 and then one more is 37 so the reason we did this because the first uh, I to the fourth is 1 to the ninth power which is 1 so you can break down high powers of I like this <coughs> we can also do something kind of similar with negative powers I won't do such a huge negative number let's do uh, I to the negative sixth Probably all these are eyes. Okay. All the bases are eyes. I think there's a, a one base a couple places, but. Oh, so that is one to the nine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, out of the fourth is one. All right, why am I allowed to just multiply by i to the fourth squared right here? Because it's one. Because it's one. So there's nothing particularly special about it other than it's one, which is why I'm allowed to multiply by it. And of course, this is i to the eighth. You just multiply those two powers. And now we can add negative 6 plus 8 is i squared. And that's negative 1. So here's how to deal with negative powers. You can just multiply by as many i to the fourths as you want, because you're just multiplying by 1.
If I had a crazy huge negative number like negative 6,000, I would just pick some crazy huge multiple of four, whatever that happens to be, and then add that in. So we're going to use, well first let's define the complex numbers. So as a set, uh, you could write them as x comma y, such that x and y are real numbers. with multiplication so when you multiply two complex numbers together oh man it's been a while I think you get x1 x2 minus y1, y2, that's the real part, and the imaginary part is x1, y2, plus x2, y1. So that's how to multiply the complex numbers. If you're wondering what in the heck am I doing, I could do with a's and b's as well. If I do that exact same multiplication with A's and B's, I have A1, A2. I am floying instead of foiling because my real parts are first and last, not the outside insides. Those still have that imaginary part. So we get A1, A2 plus I squared B1, B2 plus uh, A1, B2, I plus a2 b1 i so it's a1 a2 minus b1 b2 and I'm just grouping up the real part in parentheses and the imaginary part a1 b2 plus a2 b1 and that should match what I wrote above with x's and y's so I was trying to remember all of it when I was writing it I think I got it right Yep, so that's where that crazy multiplication comes from. Just foiling and using all your algebra rules. All right, so this should all be a review right here. None of this should be a surprise. We're going to use uh, <coughs> Z and W for a lot of our complex variables. So we use a lot of X's and Y's, but we're going to mostly use those for real numbers. <coughs> and we'll try to use uh, Z and W for complex. Now, Y, Z, and W, basically they're the letters closest to X and Y. Not the best of the alphabet, but I think they're all right around the end, right there. So we'll use Z is A1 plus I, B1. And we'll go with W as A2 plus I, B2. And of course, it doesn't matter. Uh, multiplication is commutative, so I, B1 is the same as B1, I. It doesn't matter which, which way you multiply them together. So our multiplication is commutative. So sometimes I'll write I, B1. Other times I might write B1, I. Just depends on how I'm feeling. And we can add very easily. Try to write my eyes first. How do we add these two numbers together? Kind of like the dot product, maybe? Not like the dot product. That sounds like multiplication. Well, you're adding them the similar values, no? Yes, we actually do pair it like the like the dot part of the dot product. Yeah. yeah. That's what I meant. yeah. So we go a one plus a two. So we add the reals. It's really collecting like terms. So this is the skill from algebra one. So we're just adding them together. So addition is pretty much trivial. It's, it's very easy to do. Uh, multiplication I did above. So it's already demonstrated there. And now we'll look at division. So 
So we're supposed to turn division into multiplication the way we do it. We're going to multiply by conjugate over conjugate. Now conjugates look really bad. The conjugate notation is a horizontal line, also known as an overbar. So it looks really bad when it's also in a fraction. Is there such a thing as a sum? Because I pretty much kind of like what we're here. It's just a sum. You just add like terms together. Uh, product gets a little weird because there's lots of products. There's a dot product, there's a uh, cross product, scalar product. There's lots of different types of products, basically. Uh, sum is less, there's less ambiguity in a sum. You pretty much have to have two of the exact same types of things to add together. Uh, that gets into the idea of basically what a product is, is kind of measuring an area of a rectangle where your units don't have to match, necessarily. Like you could have uh, three chickens and just two height of two, and then you have six chickens if you fill it up. Like it doesn't have to be the same thing. Yeah. Um, it can be very different like three units. Three chickens and two eggs, and then you'll get like five chickens. Yeah, well, it's a little, yeah, well. Because technically they're. I don't know. <laughs> My point is uh, when you multiply, you don't have to have the same units. Like it doesn't. You don't have to, you can have just one that's just like a scalar and the other one that actually has a unit. So like the number two times three chickens is six chickens, for example. So that would be what I would call scalar multiplication. Yeah. Whereas like two chickens times three chickens technically be six chickens squared. So it's a little more strange. There's but you're measuring like, chickens. let's do inches. Two inches by three inches <laughs> is six square inches. Yeah. Whereas two inches just times three is six inches total. But it's like a linear six inches versus a six square inches. That's the difference between the two. So it's kind of like scalar multiplication versus regular multiplication. Probably would have been better with the visual. Too late now. All right, so when we multiply this out, why in the world would we multiply by W bar in the denominator? There's one very important reason why we want that product. No. Why is that way better than just W or just W bar? You would have the square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1. So you just have negative 1. So it basically cancels out our complex, our imaginary part. So it gives us a real number in the denominator. And the identity is if you multiply the conjugate by uh, the number, you get the magnitude squared. Or the, what else do we call this? The modulus, the absolute value. There's a lot of different terms for it. The radius or the hypotenuse in polar form, which is where we're about to go. So that's the magnitude squared if you multiply a conjugate by the number itself. So we're going to get into polars now. Polars with a P. <laughs> yeah, I don't joke around very much. <laughs> Say outrageous things, but I'm usually not joking. <laughs> so here's our number A plus IB. So B measures how far you're going on the imaginary axis or the vertical axis. So if we're going to write uh, label these axes. This vertical one is R, I, or the imaginary axis, and the other horizontal axis is just the real numbers. So we got an imaginary copy of the real numbers and a regular copy of the real numbers right there. And we plot our point, go over A, go up B. We can of course measure this in a different way using polars. So we measure the amount that we basically rotate it off the x-axis or off the real axis with theta, and then r is the distance we are from zero. So good formula for r, it's the modulus of z. How do we get the modulus of a plus ib? Yep, you're basically taking the magnitude. What you do not want to do, and I'll do this in red. What is IB squared? Negative C squared. 
negative b squared. So if you do this, if you leave the i in there, you're going to be subtracting on your uh, magnitude. So don't do this. Make sure i does not make it in there. Uh, and I recommend leave negatives out because you don't want to accidentally square a negative to a negative. So you should not have any negative in your modulus whatsoever. Every term should be positive or as low as zero. If What's that coordinate is zero. Again? Absolute value. Oh. Magnitude. Oh, yeah. All the same thing. All right, so don't do that mistake there in red and leave the imaginary coefficient in there. So this is R, your book. Uh, calls this arg z a r g of z where z is the name of this number right here so if you know your angle you can also write z in polar form r times cos theta plus i sine theta I don't know if your book uses the sys function because I think the sys function was uh, popularized after 1968, which is when the book was written. Wow. So sys theta stands for cosine i sine. So it stands for cos theta plus i sine theta. I'll use some fancy colors. So that's C the i and the s are where the name of the function came from. If we're running polar form, it used to be r. What's that? If we wrote in polar form, it would just be r? Well, r's a, real, r's a real r's a real number. So, you're, I mean, unless you're imaginary part 0, you're going to have... If you're imaginary part 0, that means theta is 0 or uh, pi. So... No, I'm not assuming the number is real here at all. The radius is always a real number. It's just the distance from the origin to your, your number. All right, so let's talk about complex functions. I don't think we've gotten really much into that before. So we'll start with the, I think, the, one of the only complex functions you've really seen. So it's good to start a pla in a place you know, and then go to places you haven't been to from there. So e to the z is e to the a plus ib. I'm going to use the algebra rule. This is e to the a, e to the ib. In this form, you have seen a function like this before. The letters you're used to looking at are r e to the i theta. So this is Euler's form of complex numbers. So in this form, r would be e to the a. We've done that before. Take a con e to a constant is just some different constant. So that's no big deal. We'll just call that constant r. And b, what b measures in this form is the angle theta. A little bit weird, but if you take e to a complex power, what you're actually going to be looking at, the radius is e to the real part, and the angle is the imaginary part, the imaginary coefficient. So let's come back to this e to the I'm going to write it as e to the a, e to the i b. Did I write that anywhere? No. This cis function right here is exactly the same as e to the i b, or in this case, e to the i theta. That's all the cis function is. It's the Euler. It's the angle part of the Euler form. So we got cos, let me get this r's and thetas out. So we got e to the a, 
cos b plus i sine b. So we got radius and an angle. So we had a bunch of Taylor polynomials. And each of the x's is probably the easiest one to write down. So we can write a summation x to the k over k factorial from 0 to infinity. So it's been a while from Taylor polynomials, so I don't expect you to have them all memorized. But you do remember they exist, hopefully. That's back in chapter s 10? ten? Chapter 10. We computed a bunch of them. This is an easy one to compute. All right, so what we're about to do is replace x by z. Writing this down is not very exciting. Yes. Because it's awesome. <laughs> Unless you approximate things. Yeah. No, are you upset at Mr. Capacitor? <laughs> for confusing you earlier? <laughs> or was it Mr. What was the other R word? Mr. Resistor? <laughs> that you're upset with. <laughs> Alright, let's look at sine. So there's another one for sine and another one for cosine. I'm going to write them down with z's. You can flip to the back of your calculus book, but there, I think there's eight common ones back there. There was a sine, cosine, ln, e, and probably three other ones that I can't remember off the top of my head. But we're going to use the sine and cosine now. Yep, yeah, there's a couple more. Uh, the reason that we're using e is basically this. We're looking at this function, e to the z. The reason we're going to use cosine and sine is because uh, this right here. So I'm basically exploring this relationship using the Taylor expansions of each of these three functions. So that's what we're going to do right now. So we're going to need to write the Taylor series we're going to make some sheets? Yes, you will, but not yet. Well, there's actually a section that deals with uh, how to solve them using Taylor series, using the expanded series forms. Okay. Uh, when we get to there, you will. Okay. But it'll be obvious when we get there, yeah. All right, so I'm just going to write down the sine and cosine. And I'm writing it with z's, but this should be right out of your calculus book. So sine starts 1 to infinity, z to the 2k minus 1 over 2k minus 1 factorial with negative 1 to the k minus 1. And then cos z cos starts at zero. Basically, the even analog of sine. I'm pretty sure I talked about this in when, when we derived these. But the reason cosine is even should be pretty clear in this form, why cosine is an even function. It's also clear when you look at the graph and you know what even symmetry means, but cosine is an even function, and it's obvious in this form. You have all even powers. Sine is an odd function. You have all odd powers. So that's one of the reasons even and odd are these. I want to know what is sine of i.
I think we're just going to use the sign um, identity right above for the sign expansion right here. So I'm just plugging into what's right above. think we can get a good <clears throat> the only summation that we really know what the sum is is geometric and this is not geometric right here the geometric sum r to the k, k equals 0 to infinity 1 over 1 minus r when r is small another problem is the uh, i is not magnitude is not less than 1 so that's another issue so I don't think I can find the sum in this form. It is true it's equal, but I don't have a good way to find the sum in this form right here. All right, so we'll scratch that. All right, let's think about e to the i. This is e to the i times 1. Uh, I can graph that out pretty easily. So this is angle of 1 right here. So this is e to the i theta, where theta equals 1. What units do we measure angles in in this form? What units do we always measure angles in? Radians. Unless you know you're in degrees, unless you have a good reason to use degrees, everything we've done is in radians mm -hmm. in pre-calculus class. So where is the angle of one radian? 6.28 something something radians gives me a full rotation. So we're a little bit less than a sixth. So somewhere quadrant one right here, that will be one. So it would be approximately a sixth of a rotation. A little tiny bit less than a sixth. It's close to pi over six. Technically it's pi over pi, which is pi over 6.28. All right, so this is the uh, <coughs> I. That's e to the i right there. So why in the world am I doing this? Maybe some of those identities I wrote down. There we go. We're going to use this right here. Oh, but then I need to know cosine of i. Oh, that's going to be annoying. Yeah, so it's equal to cosine negative i. sure to get a nice closed form for sine i other than to just write it out as that summation right there you can still write this as cos of theta plus i sine theta and because our theta is one we have cos 1 plus i sine 1 still not sine of i oh let's not worry about this it doesn't really matter what sine i is we're going to find some more identities right now
So we'll just leave it with that summation right there. So we're going to write some identities now. So let's start with easy ones. What's e to the 0? 1. Uh, e to the z1 plus z2. How can I rewrite that? e to the z1 times e to the z2. So multiply bases is adding powers. And uh, for negative powers, we'll do positive powers first. Let's write the e to the z first before I forget that. Uh, e to the z. No, we don't have e to the z. e to the i z is cis z, which is cos z plus i sine z. e to the negative i z. Uh, I could write cis of negative z, but cis is neither even nor odd, so that's not really going to help me if I write cis of negative z. So we'll just go right to the right side. So we got cos negative z plus i sine negative z. And cosine is even, so this is cos z sine is odd, so it's cos z minus i sine z. How in the world can I solve for sine z? I see i sine z appearing twice. So I will factor on i, but they're in two different equations. So you have to be careful. You can't set an equation equal to another equation. You can solve for the same thing and then set the other sides equal. Yeah. So you, that's substitution. So basically we have choices of substitution or elimination. In elimination we're going to add or subtract. We're going to basically do an algebraic operation to two equations um, and come out with a third equation that hopefully is simpler in some sense. So it looks like I could subtract the two equations basically. Uh, I don't want to add them because then I'll be solving for cos z. So I want to know about sine z. So I could subtract them with elimination. So I'll just rewrite these equations. the i z is cos z plus i sine z and e to the negative i z was cos z minus i sine z alright subtract those two divide by 2i all right any questions on that identity we just got right there I don't want I in the denominator so how in the world can I get I out of the denominator What can I multiply by? So I can't just multiply by i. That's illegal. Yeah. Can't multiply by anything. Yeah. Yep. I multiply by one. I want to multiply by i, but I have to multiply by i over i. Uh, this will leave me negative on the bottom, so let's multiply by negative i over negative i. So I'm going to get negative i squared, which is positive one. 
So now we have 2 in the denominator. And the numerator, each of these are negative. We got, there's still times an i. And actually, we'll leave that i in the denominator. That's how your book leaves it. book does do a tiny change of form, but pretty trivial. They write 1 over 2i times e to the iz minus e to the minus iz. Now this should feel very much like the hyperbolic sign, if you remember way back from Calc 2. So that's our sine z identity, 1 over 2i, e to the iz, minus e to the minus iz. And do the same thing for cosine z. So there should be a very similar form for cosine. And I'll scroll the page back over to the right. What algebra should I do to solve for cosine z? Add the two equations together. So we go from subtracting to adding, and do your work down here. So I want to find cosine z. Cosine is one half e to the iz plus e to the negative iz. So I'm pretty sure these last few identities were new for you. So there's another fact that we need. easy place to see it. Probably the cis identity right here. So we know, first of all, we know e to any real number is not zero. There's no way to raise e to a power and get zero uh, when it, the power is real. When the power is complex, it also can equal zero. The easiest way to see that is this version right here. If you think, is there any angle that makes cosine and sine zero at the same time? There's no angle that I I make them both zero at the same time. And you might be worried, oh, well, they're not real. The, you know, z is not real. But we do have an identity for sine and cosine of complex numbers, and it's down below. And basically, you cannot make uh, these both be zero. But if you pick a z that makes this zero, it'll make, sh it, it, there's no way that the one before it's going to be zero basically. And vice versa. If you make the top one zero, the bottom one won't be zero. You can't make them both zero at the same time. Alright, so e to the z is never zero for all z in c. Which is nice, that's the same property in real numbers as well. So the next thing we're going to do is look at independence of functions. Then homogeneous, then homogeneous linear ODE with constant coefficients. So we're about to get into higher degree differential equations, and we're going to solve the easiest types of higher degree differential equations first. And we're not just doing complex numbers for fun. So we'll get complex 